the topic I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, urban identification, safety, and processing. Obviously, this is a very big topic, so I'm, I'm only going to focus on what practitioners need to know. You don't need to know the things that people that are in the urban industry or urban trade needs to know. Right? Uh, my name is Tony Cheng, and uh, I'm a registered practitioner in and a registered acupuncturist. Uh, but I'm also the owner of a herbal company called River Herbs. If you'd like to get in touch with us, the website and the Facebook page is here. Also, my business card is available. Uh, as you know, I was supposed to be here two weeks ago and uh, brought you guys some samples. And, um, and uh, today, rather than giving you samples of herbs, we brought you some samples of organic goji berries. So please feel free to take some home before you leave tonight. It is professional to begin a, con a presentation by talking about one's conflict of interest. So I'd just like to go over that. I have been using lab tested herbs myself since 2005. So obviously I have a bias and preference towards lab tested herbs. And I'm going to talk about what lab tested herbs means. I'm, I've owned and operated my clinic, River Clinic, since 2010. And ever since I started my clinic, I've used nothing but lab tested and organic quality herbs. So again, if I seem preferential towards them, at least I can say that that is what I preach. I practice what I preach. Um, since 2013, I, be, I became the owner of River Herbs. And uh, we source, again, lab tests and, and, um, and organic herbs from two very reputable <coughs> companies in California, New Herbs and Spring Wind. Spring, Her Spring Wind is owned by Andy Ellis. Some of you might recognize his name as, as an author of your textbooks. And finally, just as of this year, we are the Eastern Canadian distributor for New Herbs. So if I sell a little bit, uh, um, supportive or enthusiastic about the pro my products, um, that you, you, you know why perhaps there's a little bit of conflict of interest. My objective tonight is to help you understand the prevalence of the misidentified species of the herbs in the Chinese herbal market today. Help you understand the problem of heavy metals and pesticides and what that does to your patients. Help you understand the wide rampant practice of sulfur fumigation that exists in the herbal industry how, what that does to your patients, and more importantly, how that reduces the efficacy of the herbs. I'd like to introduce you to the concept of wild-crafted herbs, lab-tested herbs, and organic herbs, and what are the differences. Finally, I'd like to help impress upon you that when you, in, in school, when you learn about herbal medicine processing, also known as pao chi, how that really is very relevant and important, even in modern day practice. <coughs> I have been, some, you know, uh, as people have joked, my colleagues have joked that I'm the Edward Snowden of, 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 the, herbal, of, the, of the herbal trade. So I'm kind of a whistleblower. And uh, uh, this information is widely known because uh, I was trained in the U.S. Uh, but I feel the practitioners in, the, in Canada are not as cognizant and mindful of these, of these issues. So I'm not here to, I'm not here to um, you know, bring a bad name to Chinese medicine. In fact, I'm trying to elevate the awareness of the problem so that we as practitioners that decide which herbs we carry and therefore we are in the position to demand change by the herbal agricultural farmers that are the ones that are producing this. If you insist on buying safe herbs, then unsafe practices will automatically end because no one's going to buy them if they're anything other, other than that. Okay? As you know, Chinese medicine doesn't exactly have a very good reputation. Anytime Chinese herbs makes the media or makes the a medical journal is because somebody died or somebody got cancer, right? So the public and Western establishment is not going to help us. It's up to us to speak for ourselves. Okay? So that's my agenda, if anything, is to empower you, to, to inform you, so that we can do and improve our own medicine. It's up to us, nobody else. Let's begin with authentication. Authentication is a concept that can be that can be um, uh, described as Dao Di. And there's a constant Chinese medicine, just like in the, in, the, in the wine trade, of being something being geo-authentic. So for example, everybody knows that champagne is not champagne if it's not from the champagne region. It's only called sparkling wine if it's, if it's from any other part of the world. So there, there's a similar concept in Chinese medicine. An herb is expected to be of the best quality for a certain geographic region. Why? Because those geographic regions contain the right altitude, the right weather parameters, the right soil parameters, Okay, to allow the most optimal growth of those herbs. So you might, for example, in your herbal class, learn about herbs that have prefixes called Tron. Tron is for Sichuan province, Sichuan province. Tron means that that herb should, uh, uh, for example, for example Tron Shou, right? Or Tron Niu Xi. Those things are supposed to come from the Sichuan province because that was what makes it geo-authentic. Now the, 
the idea of authenticity is not just about where it's grown. Sometimes um, uh, there's also the concept of processing that makes it superior. So for example, ginseng can be grown anywhere in the world. It grows in North America naturally. It grows in China, it grows in Korea. But it's generally well accepted that Korean ginseng is of the highest quality. So it's the highest quality or more authentic, not because that is, it, can, it can only grow in Korea, but it's because of secret processing techniques that accentuate and augment the properties of ginseng that the Koreans have a secret recipe or generational experience that is well preserved and well passed on that we consider it to be of higher quality. So it's important to understand that authenticity is important when it comes to geography, but it's not because of where it grows necessarily. It can also be because of how certain regional practicing and processing methods that makes it superior. When it comes to authenticity, modern practices now in, in use uh, PCRs and genetic authentication to determine the right species for these plants. And by what we mean by the right species is based on the People's Republic uh, Materia Medica, um, or uh, Pharmacopoeia, in other words. And so um, this book is uh, at least 10 volumes in length, and uh, it's, it's described well over 5,000 different herbs. And they describe what is how to properly identify them, what's the right species, uh, how to properly test them using molecular biology techniques. Obviously, in ancient times, we didn't we don't have these molecular biology techniques. In ancient times, they would have used macroscopic ways of, of authenticating them. So, as a practitioner dealing with hands, dealing with herbs, and we touch them and um, and uh, dispense them, it is the macroscopic level of authentication I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. Clearly, this is a, a huge topic, so it's not possible to go over all the problems with in, in authentication, but I'll point out some of the most common problems, some of the problems I've encountered as I was starting out my own herbal pharmacy, procuring herbs from local distributors. If you're looking, taking a look here is a herb called shogun, and um, the, the shogun is actually, the uh, um, medicinally bioactive portion of shogun is actually the, the lateral root portion called the rhizoma portion on the left here. But if you weren't knowledgeable, or perhaps you look young and inexperienced, and you go to a local distributor asking to buy shogun, perhaps you just handed them an order sheet and you wrote shogun on the list, and then at the end of the day they gave you a whole bunch of herbs to take home, and you didn't take a look at what they gave you, there's a good chance, as I have found, that they might give you the herb portion of shogun, meaning the part that's in, in botany is the aerial portion, the part that's above the ground, versus the part that's below the ground. Unfortunately, the price of bronze ground has, has absolutely no medicinal property. And so you've just been scammed, unfortunately. Shansugu okay, is a great herb. And uh, when I first learned about the, the power of this herb, it actually contains uh, uh, natural colchicine, which can be used to treat gout and a, lot of, a number of autoimmune problems. So I thought it would be great to have access to this herb. Uh, and, uh, and when I went to local distributors and I asked them I wanted Sansugu, they gave me a grassy version of Sansugu, much like the previous slide, they're trying to sell me something that's above the ground. And uh, even as a student, I knew, know that, that's where learning Latin helps a little bit, that this is called a pseudobulbus, so it should be some type of bulb, it was not a grass, it was not a herba. And uh, so why is this dealer trying to sell me something that's herba? So I, I said, you know, I think that's not, uh, I think it's supposed to be some kind of bulb, you know, something below the ground. It, and he took out a, a, a herbal dictionary and, and tried to convince me, that, look, it says it's supposed to be an herbal part. Maybe he honestly didn't know himself, so that's another problem, okay? Um, then finally, I insisted, 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 and he said, okay, you know, one second, I think we do have some a little bit, let me check for you. So I'll produce this version, okay? So this is actually the wrong species, for Guang Sigu or Bai Guang Gu. Okay, as you can see, it looks like a bulb, okay? But unfortunately, it's not the right species, therefore it's not gonna have the right effect. Good, good. Gugan is actually a food item. You can buy this from supermarkets in, in Chinatown, okay, or even uh, in uh, any of the Asian malls um, at Pat Mall. And um, Gugan, according to the Chinese Materia Medica, um, the, the, uh, the proper species of Gugan for medicinal purposes should be Thomsoni, and it looks like this. But you might have occasion you come across Gugan that looks like this. Okay? Um, this is called Fenge. It's very white, very powdery. People, the average consumer likes to buy very white, pretty things. So this is not white and pretty, so it doesn't sell well. So, be, so because of that reason, supermarkets carry this stuff. This stuff is considered food grade, as opposed to medicinal grade. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's probably not as potent okay, for your purposes. 
Another example is kumbu. This is actually a food item again. It's often used in Japan, Korean Japanese cuisine as seaweed, kombu. And uh, this, is the, this is actually the proper genus and species. And if you ever prepare kumbu yourself in a soup or an upscale Japanese restaurant, you'll know it looks like this. No Japanese restaurant ever serves kumbu that looks like that. But unfortunately, that's the type of uh, kumbu you would get uh, in Toronto, in New York, anywhere in North America, because most of these herbs in North America come by way of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong practitioners tend to prefer this type of kumbu. It's called Guang. Kumbu comes from Guangdong province or Canton province. Are they nutritionally different? What's that? Are they nutritionally different, the two varieties? No. Um, it, for some herbs, they are comparable. So I'm not. I'm not saying that just because it's from Hong Kong is bad, but in some cases they're not comparable, and in, and in some and in some cases, um, 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 it's confusing for the students because you have a, something in the book that shows one thing or the other. And then you go into the store expecting to buy that, and you get something else in return. If you're, you're very confused, imagine how confused your patients are going to be, right? Mm -hmm. Next one here is Huang Bai, philodendry. And uh, the common Huang Bai that's readily available is, again, Guang Huang Bai. And one quick look at these Huang Bai, you can tell that this Huang Bai is a lot subtler in the yellow color than this Huang Bai. Don't be confused by this bark portion. Focus on the portion that's the yellow portion that is beneath the bark. The yellow color, uh, you can see from the back, this is more more faint, right? That one's more that one's more darker. What make, what gives it the yellow color is an active ingredient called berberin, and it, it is the active ingredient is what makes it yellow. So we, even with, even if you didn't know the active ingredient is berberin, if you know the active ingredient is what is it, what makes it yellow is the active ingredient. Already you can tell which herb is going to be more effective. Shema, again there's a version of Guang Shema, and this is the, the type of Shema you would get uh, uh, from a lot of suppliers locally. Um, but the Shema we learned in our te textbook is Simit Si Fuge, which has this beautiful lattice-like structure. This is the Shema that, um, that uh, uh, Li Dongyuan would have used, not this Shenyang, the Shenma. Okay? Li Dongyuan is the thing that is obsessed about lifting the young. Bai Tong Bai Tong as you know, fire toss in for dysentery. And um, even, in, back, even in, in school, uh, because when the school in New York and the carriers from Hong Kong as well, the, the, the um, uh, Bai Tong that I learned in school was this one. Okay? But it turns out this is a completely different species and genus. It's called Shen Se Tang. The proper vital one is actually pulsatilic, and it looks like this. And so one is actually erratic, and one is a one is a tsao erba. Complete. Now is it not only is it <coughs> species and genus, it's a completely different part of the plant. Sabaye, sabaye is actually from a coniferous type of plant. So as you one quick look at that, you know that it looks very much like something that came from a uh, from a Christmas wreath or a Christmas tree, right? This looks more like something that came from a bamboo tree, not, uh, nothing like it. A, it is a, a coniferous tree. Okay? But unfortunately, if you were to ask for um, ye locally, you oftentimes get this. So be careful. This is actually Lohan Songye. Jin Jian Cao is great for dealing with stones of any sort, gallstones, kidney stones. There's a Again, a Cantonese version called Guang Jin Jian Cao, and it's not the one that is considered the correct species according to People's Republic's pharmacopoeia. Now, this one here is very scary. Mujapi, Mujapi is a, a considered tonic, right? And I have had the opportunity to present this to a lot of different type of audiences, even audiences uh, where the, uh, most of the practitioners in the audience are teaching doctors trained in China. And they tell me that even, if, even when they were students in China, the Mujapi that I learned is this one. Well, this is not Wujapi, this is Niu Bai Teng. And if you look at the Latin, it's a collis. Collis means a vine. Now, if you have some experience identifi uh, identifying uh, herbal samples, you know that a lot of vines have these radial spokes type of appearance. This is consistent with mo most of the vines look like this, right? Now, so clearly it looks like a vine, but why is it called a cortex? Wujapi is supposed, proper Wujapi is supposed to be a, a, a cantopanasis cortex. That's proper Wujapi. And this is a huge problem because 
Typically, you use GIP for deficient B syndrome. Let's say you have a weakness in kidney, weakness in liver, so you have a quantified the bone, quantified the sinews for the deficient type B. Uh, unfortunately, your bio actually has no tonification property whatsoever. Zizal. Zizal is a great purple grass for treating dermatological, dermatological problems that have a uh, violation of purplish appearance. Okay. And um, this is from the local distributors. Okay. And uh, um, this, as a herbal teacher myself, sometimes my <coughs> students will ask me, oh, how can we carry this in, uh, in our pharmacy? And, uh, and uh, before I got into this area, I didn't have an answer. Okay. But fortunately, these proper species and substitutes or variants um, uh, are already available from the uh, pharmacopoeia. <coughs> Pubong is a pollen. Good quality Pubong should be very fine, almost like a, uh, uh, almost like a uh, cumin, okay, a spice. But the poor quality ones contains parts of the plant uh, known as the, the stems, the stem of the flower, okay, and. Uh, so this is this is not a uh, very good quality uh, uh, because that contains uh, other parts of the plant that is not pollen. So perhaps bits and bits and pieces of the flower and so on and so forth. So imagine if you're a practitioner and you're, you're going to get dose this by weight. If you got this version, you're only pro you're definitely underdosing because you're not getting pound for pound the same amount of pollen that you prescribe. You're getting a lot of other uh, parts fillers of that plant. Wampudo Shin okay, is vicarious semen, and as the name semen implies, it should be a seed. Okay? But oftentimes, here in Toronto, when you order Wampudo Shin, you get a Guangdong Wampudo Shin, which is this type of variety. That one is a seed. Yeah, that's a seed. It's supposed to be a seed. And this one is not peeled. What's that? And the right. No, it's not even the same plant. It's not even the same species. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to take a little segue now. And rather than talk about authentication, we're now going to talk about the problem of heavy metals and pesticides. In the herbal industry, uh, or in the scientific community, this paper is generally known as the Harvard study. Okay? You will recognize among its authors, <coughs> Ted Kavchek, the author of The Web Has No Weaver, right? Everybody has heard of him before. Uh, this is a joint collaboration between Harvard, as well as uh, two of the very reputable TCM schools in, in, uh, in Asia. Beijing University TCM, as well as the Hong Kong Baptist University. These are probably considered the top two TCM institutions in China. And um, <coughs> uh, the purpose of the study was to take a close look at the, the presence of heavy metal and pesticides, pesticides in commonly prescribed Chinese herbal medicines. And the study is designed as follows. They investigated 334 total herbal samples comprising of 126 different species. Some of them were cultivated, some of them were wild specimens. All 334 samples were tested for heavy metals as well as pesticides. And, and then 294 out of these 334 samples were tested for um, uh, 162 different pesticides. So here are the outcomes. <coughs> there I found that all 334 samples had at least one metal that was detectable. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, 34 of them, it should be, uh, uh, that should be 10%, uh, right? not 150%. Um, um, 34. 10% and 115 of the samples. Oh, sorry, yeah, have five metal detected. And then 30, 37%, so a little bit over a third of them, um, they were able to detect anywhere from one to nine pesticides anywhere from one to nine pesticides. Mercury was found in each, um, uh, was found, but within, within acceptable, acceptable limits in all these samples, and I'll talk about what's considered acceptable limit, what's not. Finally, they found an insecticide, or another pesticide called, called chlorophyrophos, which was detected in one out of every four samples. So 25% of the herbs have, that set, have this uh, pesticide, but this is a pesticide that the pharmacopoeia has not yet recognized, rec not yet identified. So what that means is that these farmers are ahead of the regulators. They're using pesticides that are not yet known to the regulators and therefore not being tested. So you can never say there's no pesticide. All you can say is there's no detectable pesticide. You're not going to find something unless you know what you're looking at. The interpretation and conclusion of the study is quite interesting. The wild have harvested herbs, meaning the herbs that are not grown by men, 
actually have more heavy metal and more pesticides. So that just goes to show you the, the world that we live in today. Uh, when you grow something, it's probably actually much better right, versus what's actually around nature. They also found that um, based on the most likely route of administering, which is through decoction and then drinking and de decoction, that thankfully 95% of the samples are not likely to have levels of pesticides and mercury uh, and heavy metal that is considered uh, above safety range. But what, does, what that does say is that 5% or 1 in 20 of them are going to have a problem. So 1 in 20 of them is going to be difficult for you to know okay, which one of the 20 that the, the, the dispense is going to have these problems. The only way you can know for sure is to actually do testing. When we talk about heavy metals, we, talk, we are usually talk about things like arsenic, cadmium, mercury, lead. Those are the, these are the four big uh, heavy hitters. And uh, to make a long story short, either they are carcinogens or they are neurotoxins. So the reason why, um, the, um, the reason why there is perhaps such a rise in fertility today, the reason why there is um, all these um, yet to be diagnosed degenerative neurological problems today, right, such as mercury. People have noticed for years that they suspect it's due to heavy metals in our environment that, that we're unaware of, or perhaps an ancient old piping in our, in our sewer systems, and so on and so forth. Um, the Harvard paper has shown that mercury is detectable in all the herbs, but it is within normal range. Okay, so when we talk about normal range, what are we talking about? Normal, uh, acceptable range. Heavy metals do exist around us. In, in some, some plants ha carry uh, heavy metals. But as long as they're within an acceptable range, they're not going to cause us any, any bodily harm. For mercury, it's expected to, have to be under 0 0.1 parts per million, PPM stands for parts per million, whereas lead has the, has the, the highest cutoff. It ha it's accepted <coughs> under 5 parts per million. Now, because heavy, heavy metals uh, usually um, enter the plant through the soil, the part of the herbs, the, the, the herbs that we use in Chinese material medica that come from the root portions of the plant, or the rhizoma portion of the plant, are more likely to be subjected to uh, heavy metal type of problems, as opposed to say the floral part of the plant, or the leafy parts of the plant. Now let's talk about pesticide. What you're looking at here is a close-up of zexie, in which tiny little holes have been burrowed through by what's known as herbal beetles. So obviously, it's in a farmer's interest to use pesticides to protect his or her crop so that they can have a consistent, reliable yield every year to hand off to the market so that they don't take a financial hit. Um, and uh, um, the most common type of pesticides are used are con considered various type of organic substances. Okay? And the way that these pesticides work is that they basically are neurotoxins to the insect. So it paralyzes their breathing, it paralyzes their way to move. If you cannot move, you cannot feed, you die. If you cannot breathe, you die. So um, now, unfortunately, paired, uh, heavy metals and pesticides are bioaccumulative. So even though there's, they might be a, a small concentration to kill a small critter like an insect, but when they accumulate in your body or you're consuming a large amount of them, then it can be of sufficient toxicity to human nervous system as well. According to the 2010 People's Republic Pharmacopoeia, <coughs> they looked at 175 out of 490 plants and fungi, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of these, okay, most do not require pesticides. They don't require pesticides, doesn't mean that the farmers do not use pesticides. But what, when they say it does not require pesticides, that means that the pharmacopoeia says some herbs require pesticides. Imagine the pharmacopoeia says that an herb requires pesticides. Okay? 14 herbs are required to have prolonged multiple high doses of pesticides, whereas 35 herbs commonly require frequent use of pesticides. In other words, 10% of plant-based herbs require, uh, are considered to require pesticides. And the pesticides are most likely going to be found in fruits because fruits are sweet and more likely to be, to be uh, insects and bugs to like them more. Okay? And, uh, or um, herbs are commonly used in culinary 
uses. So meaning there, there, there's a high demand for these type of product, so therefore there's an incentive for the farmer to use a lot of pesticides to preserve their, 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 their productivity. Here are the, num the 14 herbs according to the 2010 pharmacopoeia that require multiple high doses of pesticides. Okay? So Baiju and Dangwe, Gojitsu, Jinghua, these are things we use a lot, Renshen, Sanxi is notorious for high pesticides. In fact, one of my distributors would outright say, sorry, even though my distributors say that they carry lab-tested quality herbs, they'll say, sorry, that one, we just cannot get it. That's the non-pesticide version. We can, however, offer you <coughs> that we found on the market has at least a male of pesticide. But there simply is no Sanxi that just has no pesticides. Jinghua as well. Jinghua is almost impossible to find it without any pesticides, unless you're growing your own backyard. Now here are the herbs that require frequent use of pesticides. Okay. Again, a lot of herbs are used commonly. Bai Shao, Bai Zhi, Bai Langen, Gan Jiang, Wang Yan, Wang Qi, Ji Hua, Mu Dan Pi, these are things I use every day. Shen Di, Shen Di Huang, Shu Di Huang, Tao Ren, these herbs require frequent use of pesticides. And it's considered, it's considered acceptable. Another problem that you might not be aware of, and I certainly was not aware of this before I got into the herbal business, is the problem of sulfur fumigation. What you're looking at here is what readily happens every day is in countryside where herbs are grown and, and harvested. This is, a pro this is a process that has been invented since the Ming Dynasty. So it's not exactly new. Right? It is considered a part of traditional Chinese medicine, but just because it's traditional does not mean it's safe necessarily. What is happening here is that they're taking blocks of sulfur, putting it under a rack, what you're seeing here is actually uh, shanyao, okay? this is a type of mountain yam, and um, rather than uh, drying it in the sun over two or three days, like the way it should have been done traditionally, uh, farmers are already in the interest of saving time, and also because sulfur has an um, antimicrobial preservative properties, um, they use sulfur to speed up the drying process, so that rather than spending two or three afternoons to do this, it can be done in one afternoon. Basically, they're burning the sulfur, and the smoke of the sulfur, it's like smoking meat. The smoke gets into the meat, and that's how the meat doesn't go bad, right? Same thing, the smoke goes into this, so the herb is not going to go bad. Except there's actually not just the smoke, it's the sulfur portion, which a lot of people are, have irritation to. So according to Hangzhou's FDA, they estimate that 60 to 70 of the 60 to 70 percent of the herbs on the market have sulfur fumigation. But if you add, ask those in the trade, they'll say that at least 90% of the herbs have been having sulfur fumigated. Now at first when I became aware of the problem of sulfur fumigation, I, I was disappointed, but I understand why farmers do it, uh, because the people want to buy very beautiful white looking herbs. Sulfur fumigation makes the herb bleach system, makes them look white and pristine, okay? And more attractive. But, um, um, but uh, um, it has some, Indirect uh, side effects, uh, a positive effects for the farmer. It reduces microbial contamination. It, it reduces the chance of having mold and fungus. Um, those are the type of things that can, can, can obviously spoil your herbs in your, 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 your production. So what's the problem when you take sulfur? Sulfur is an irritant to the mucous membrane. So especially somebody who has asthma or any type of atopic individual, when you're exposed to sulfur, it, it's going to worsen the atopic condition. Um, uh, rosacea, for example, is a problem that is said to be worse with alcohol, which has sulfites. It, it's said to be worse when you consume a lot of garlic, which has naturally occurring sulfur. So imagine you're treating a patient for rosacea with Chinese herbs, and you didn't know of this sulfite, a sulfur fumigation that herbs, you are directly making them worse without knowing. Right? Now here are some problems with the uh, um, uh, sulfur. In general, and, and sulfur are found in a lot of our foods. It's not just a Chinese herb problem. You, you got to look at the label. Did you know that frozen vegetables all contain sulfite? Go home and check. Okay, frozen vegetables go bad, so they have to contain sulfite. Neurological um, <coughs> problems such as urticaria. Okay, um, for the select individual, it might give them nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. In very serious consequences, it can result in seizure, fainting, and there has been reported cases of that. Now. Of course, I was in, I, as an herbal practitioner, I, tried, I, I prescribe herbs all the time. 
I understand that not everybody is going to be so sensitive to sulfur. Um, perhaps you can do a screen and find out, are they, are they, is there any reason that, that uh, this patient has reason to think that they have sulfur sensitivity? Then I just won't recommend herbs for them. But unfortunately, I wish that was that simple. This is a study that was published out of Hong Kong, uh, out of Baptist University, as I mentioned, one of the best TCM schools in Hong Kong. And what they were investigating is what happens when you sulfur an ingredient such as baishao. Peony fluorine is the active ingredient in baishao. <coughs> peony, as you know, is a common name for baishao, but peony fluorine is the active ingredient. They were looking at what happened just after one hour of fumigation. Not to mention the farmers actually fumigated for many, many hours in the afternoon. Just after one hour of sulfur fumigation, the sulfur um, 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 sulfate okay, molecule becomes part of the active ingredient. It completely changes the structure. So that, so that what happens is that, you know, as you know how, how delicate the key and lock idea of a receptor are with the ligand, when you add a sulfur there, it's not going to go into the receptor, therefore it's not going to have an effect. After just one hour of sulfur fumigation, the active ingredient drops at 40%. After two hours, perhaps even 80%. Three hours, maybe there's nothing left. Okay. Will this cause a problem with uh, bioaccumulation in the body? Does sulfur, does that bioaccumulate? Um, sulfur does not bioaccumulate, but the, problem, the more serious problem is that you're giving herbs, as you're dosing 10 grams, you're actually only giving 6 grams, because you lost 40%. Oh, so it's so it's efficacy. yes, it's problem efficacy. So that's not acceptable to me. I can decide that okay, I don't want to give herbs to patients that are sensitive to sulfur, but I can't say okay, I don't I don't want to give you herbs because I want herbs that are less potent, right? That, that doesn't work. Now that's the what difference of bisol, unsulfur bisol and Chinatown bisol. Right? As you can tell, this bisol is pretty and white. People want to buy the beautiful stuff. Nature is not beautiful. Nature is ugly. Okay, nature is like that. <laughs> Other studies have been done also out of Hong Kong, looking at Bai Zhi. Right? Bai Zhi, sulfur fumigation of Bai Zhi reduces, there are two active ingredients, Imperatorin and Ocipristidinin. It draws the efficacy anywhere from 60% to 90%. So you almost have nothing left when you sulfur fumigate. Okay? Beautiful Bai Shao, natural Bai Shao. Right? <laughs> People want to buy the very white stuff because buy means white in Chinese, so they think that it should look white. Can, can you wash it that out? Just wash it. No, no, because it has, it has changed the chemical structure already. It has bound to the active ingredient. Even if you boil for 10 minutes, it's not going to be No. There are studies that show that in the decoctions, it's, it's there. Actually, cook the herbs. The decoction is in the decoction. Show me a thinking that. Yes. Okay. So, according to 2011 Chinese FDA, they permit. Okay. They 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 say that fumigation of sulfur of sulfur is 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 uh, is prohibited, but this is not enforced. But they do permit the sulfur fumigation of 11 different herbs. And here are the 11 herbs that, that sulfur fumigation is permitted. So we have Niuxi, Tianmendong, Baizhu, Baiji, Dangshen, Shanyao, Tianma, Gansui, Baishao, Fengge, and Tianhuafen. And a lot of these herbs are very white looking herbs in appearance, uh, or off-white looking appearance. And so you can appreciate why um, there, there should be the incentive to try to make it even more white. Um, like Dangsheng is yellow color, so after the sulfate, uh, it becomes it lighter color. Lighter. Yeah. I brought some Dangsheng that's not sulfated, <coughs> and you can you can probably tell that it's darker yellow. I brought some to show you later. That's the natural one, right? Uh, not natural, unsulfated one. Unsulfated. Yeah. Now this is a paper that was uh, again uh, done out of China, uh, out of uh, Jiangsu, uh, and also out of Nanjing, and um, these researchers were asked the question, is it possible to detect altered sulfur, so the, the so altered peony, the, the, the active peony is peony foreign, so when you, when you add sulfur to it, because it, it becomes peony foreign sulfate. They asked the question, um, uh, is it possible for us to have a, a testing technique where we 
take a compound formula. A compound formula is a formula that has, contains at least you know, many different ingredients. Is it possible that if the compound formula has sulfur, has a peony or bishell that's, that's uh, fumigated, are we going to be able to find, detect it? Do we have, can we create a technology that can do that? Right? So they tested um, 16 out of 17 bishell samples that they can find from a regional pharmacy <coughs> in China. 16 out of 17, like raw bishell. Then they also looked at seven granules. So these are, like, as you know, Chinese nursing being practiced in a granular format. You add water to it to reconstitute it back into solution. They took, I'd say, for example, a formula like Jiao Yishai and that contains Bai Shao. Seven different formulas that contain Bai Shao as one well of its ingredients. And tested that to see if they can find the peony sulfate. And the results of that 16 out of 17 raw Bai Shao they found all contained the, the sulfate version of Bai Shao. And seven out of seven of the granules that they found produced locally in China contained the sulfated version of Bai Shao. Just to go to show you how widely spread this problem is. Right? So this just because herbs are you get use granules does not mean you're safe. The people that make the granules go to the market and buy the herbs, but by the time the herbs reach the market, they've already been suffered fumigated. Okay. Now let's talk about the difference in terms of testing and certification. Wild crafted versus lab tested and organic. Wild crafting means herbs that are not cultivated, meaning they're not grown by man. They're natural. Okay? But we already know from the Harvard study that wild herbs are more likely to have heavy metals and pesticides. Lab testing means you're testing for the heavy metals, using those cutoffs that I mentioned, testing for known pesticides. Remember the Harvard study also found that one out of four uh, herbs can get pesticides that was not yet recognized by the pharmacopoeia. So if you didn't know what to look for, you're never going to find it. Right? So just because the lab tested does not mean it does not have any pesticides. It just means it has no detectable known pesticides. Right? Or perhaps the top 200 pesticides that you decided to test. Most 200 most common pesticides that you want to test. Organic is a different beast. Organic is a, actually a legal concept, it's a certification concept. Organic requires the use of organic farming practices, but organic farming practices is just one stage of the organic process. Once the herb is harvested, it makes its way to a warehouse where it's processing. That warehouse may not use organic practices. Okay? So just because it was grown organic does not mean it reaches the market organic. Okay? And uh, so there really is no way to know for sure. Even if it was organic, you had better yet still test it. Only testing is the only way for you to know if your herbs are safe or not. Here's an example of a wild dantian versus a cultivated dantian. Okay. And um, they look very different. Um, the cultivated dantian looks like it's on steroids. So it's very tough and big. But in the wild, life is tough in nature. You, know, you have to fend for yourself. So don't, they don't grow as impressive. But what you will notice is that they have a much more richer, beautiful red color. Right? And dan means cinnabar, which is red in color. So perhaps, um, uh, as you know, a lot of the active ingredients of the medicine are in the barks, in the cortex. Um, I would not be surprised if the, if the wild one with the darker, richer the cinnabar color is the one that's more effective. Right? But I have already mentioned that wild crafting does not mean it's safer. It has, to be, it has to be lab tested to know that it's safe. Here's an example of the certificate analysis that accompanies every order of of, um, of uh, Chinese herbs that I import from my distributor, uh, my supplier, New Herbs. And you can see the test for heavy metals, lead, cadmium, mercury, the test for the organic um, uh, pesticides, the test for E. coli, um, salmonella contamination. But more importantly, they, uh, they test it based on its, uh, uh, the right species. So you'll see that they, they talk about uh, identity. And under identity, they will say, CP 2005. CP means Chinese pharmacopoeia. According to Chinese pharmacopoeia 2005, what they determine as how to visually identify them, then um, these herbs are, are authenticated for correct species, but also for safety. You can get organic version of Chinese herbs. Not everything is available in organic, but a select, select few are available. The CCOI stands for um, uh, the California Organic, organic Farmer Certific uh, Certification Association. And, um, so you can go to the CCOF website and find out which producers 
uh, you did have organic herbs, and uh, so for example, spring wind in this example is the company, and uh, what is the herbs that they carry that is organic? So I request the organic certification of all the organic herbs that I obtain from my distributors as well, and, uh, and that must be current. Here are the list of uh, organic herbs that I'm able to obtain that I proudly carry in my dispensary. Um, there are 44 of them available. So we, can, we have, for example, um, Bai Shen I use a lot in Tang as well as a, as a dermatology practitioner. Shi Sha I use all the time. Okay. Uh, we have Gojizi, which I brought some organic ones for you to sh the samples and give you organic Gojizi. Okay. We have um, Huangqi, Huangqi available in, in um, organic. Long Dan Sao is organic. I brought some organic Long Dan Sao today. Nujianzi, Ru Gui, Sha Shen, Weizi. These are all, uh, fortunately for us, available in organic forms. But just because of organic, it has to be tested to prove that it's that safe. Because organic it might just be grown organic, but does not mean it was processed in an organic way. How, many, how much more expensive than the non-organic? Um, anywhere from 30% anywhere from to 50% more expensive. Um, so now you're looking at Long Dan Sao, okay? and this is organic Long Dan Sao, and this is um, uh, uh, not, um, a, a local Long Dan Sao. And you might think that, oh, organic Long Dan Sao is on steroids. Okay? Well, it's actually, this organic Long Dan Sao happens to be the Manchuria class DC from Manchuria, or traditionally from Manchuria. And this is considered the proper uh, species. In, uh, in Long Dan Sao, according to the Manchuria Medica. The Long Dan Sao that I had learned in school is the Triflora. There's a sort of typo, it should be a, an, an L in there, but Triflora. That's the one that is considered, it's still very effective, okay? But it's not considered the People's Republic representative. Now I just to um, talk to you about the, the important thing, Pao Chi. Okay, that's a service that we provide in the um, in-house. In, in are you looking at examples of pouch that we produce ourselves? The the, the close up is a is a pouch of which herb? You recognize that herb? People that study herbs? It's some by bees. Some by bees. Mulberry bark. So, but it's been honey fried. And you do that because somebody is good for coffee and phlegm, but if you have a dry cough, you want to honey fry the moisten them. We do a lot of in, uh, processing in house. And um, I'm just going to, uh, my slide is slightly out of sequence. I want to talk about this first. Um, so to help, you, to help you appreciate the importance of how to of, of processing, if you look at the traditional ingredients of Long Dai Shei Ben Tang, which is called Gentiana's formula to drain the liver, you'll see that a number of these ingredients are Zhou Chao. Zhou Chao means alcohol fried, alcohol processed. Okay? But if you buy... Um, herbs from the granules, let's say a, a, a granule, Long Dai Shei Gan Tang, those ingredients are just single ingredients. They're not, they're not alcohol fried ingredients. Now, people ask, well, first of all, people ask, uh, does it make that much difference? Well, it depends on your diagnosis, it depends on your, your patient, of course. Okay? But we know that Long Dai Shei Gan Tang is a formula that's very powerful for draining liver fire and draining damn heat from the lower gel. Okay? But, if you look at its traditional functions indication, it also treats things like red eyes and, and ear deafness. Red, the eyes and the ears are certainly not in the lower jaw, right? So how does the herb get to the, the upper upper jaw where the eyes and ears are located? It's by virtue of the alcohol processing that has an upper directionality. So if your patient is up, you're treating a patient due to liver fire having eye problems or damp heat, giving their damp heat in the gallbladder meridian, giving them problems in the ear, such as the Lotus media, for example, your treatment will be less effective if you didn't have the proper alcohol, alcohol uh, process version. Right? This is the experience that's been passed out in the plastics. And, you know, I have a problem when people say that you know, people, ch the Chinese medicine that we practice today is no longer the authentic Chinese medicine that was once practiced. Yet, those people are happy to use formulas that do not have the proper processing, pro proper approach. Same, you're complaining that it's not authentic, but you're quite happy practicing in a non-authentic kind of way. That has a problem if you're if you're uh, if you're a hypocrite like that. Even now, these formularies are archival in China. What's that? 
this formula is uh, arguable in China. Actually, uh, arguable. Arguable. Uh, yeah. So some people thought that this is a that this is a toxin. Yeah. Arguable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the um, arguable. Yeah. Yeah. The issue. The issue. Um, uh, I'm using this as an example of the importance of processing. So it might. It's not. It's not limited to just this formula. Okay. Any type of uh, a lot of number of formulas teach us that it should, we should use herbs that are properly processed. For example, um, um, that 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 ingredient requires um, requires um, uh, honey fried guangxi, right? Right. Okay. That um, uh, is because we want the extra nourishing for this thing. If we don't use the honey fried guangxi, the results are not going to be the same. Now I would like to um, take a minute and tell you about our herbal operation. This is our homepage. It's an on, it's a, um, online e-pharmacy, so to speak, where a practitioner, you, can create an account to prescribe herbs for your patient. And your patient can have an account to pay for the herbs themselves without you having to deal with credit cards. Right? And they can actually refill the prescription that you permit them to refill directly through this interface. This platform allows you to decide whether you want the patient to pay or the practitioner pays the order and the then patient then pays you. Okay. Then you can decide to use, to build a formula from scratch or you can create a library of your favorite formulas and you just recall them at quick, uh, quick recall. Okay. Um, and um, the way you dis dispense medication is it's a um, autofill, it's a word complete. So as you type HUA, all the herbs that start with Huang starts being populated. And you can select the ingredients and, and choose a dosage, and you get instant pricing. Pricing um, uh, for, the, for the public, pricing for the practitioner, 20% discount for the practitioner. And you get an app, immediately get a daily cost, so you can tell your patient how much it's going to cost per day. And as, as you do this, should you like this formula, you can immediately add it to your list of favorites. Then you can tell us how many days of this formula you want by selecting anywhere from 1 to, to 30 days. You can tell us whether you want to cook or you want to loose. If you want to cook, we'll cook it for, it for your patients and send it to you directly or send it to your patient directly. You can even take it to the, to, 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 if, if you're a control freak, you will love this because we give you the maximum control as an herbalist. You can decide exactly how many times you want the patient to take it a day. Okay? And you can even tell them to take it before mid afternoon or, or during, uh, before sleep. So the options are all built in. You can permit number of refills. And we will track the refills automatically so that patient can now try to call us and say, oh, I'm time for my refill, but you've actually only granted them two refills. They're trying to get the third one. The system will detect that and say, sorry, you got to go back to your practitioner, pay him or her lots of money for the consultation fee before you can come back and get us the herbs. <laughs> you can also say, what's the minimum period between refills? You don't want somebody who has mental illness to, to fill all three refills at the same time. Okay? So you want to say, okay, at least a week's got to pass before you we allow you to exercise those refills. We allow you that level of control. Okay? You can say, you want them to, when do you want that refill option to expire? You don't want somebody to take it, uh, you, you, let's say you give them two refills, they, took, they take one, and then two years later, they fill the other one. Obviously, they're not the same person they used to be two years ago. You want to say that, ex that refill expires in six months time, and then we're no longer uh, honor that refill. So a lot of thought has went into this because I myself prescribe herbs, that's the majority of my practice. And, um, and, um, and um, these are the things that I would, these are the convenience that I would like to have. So we work with the programming company to make this available to the community. Here's a close up of uh, my facility. Uh, suppose we get an order from you, it will be dispensed here uh, in our dispensing station. This is pictures of our warehouse where we have high quality lab tested and uh, 44 plus organic herbs. This is the, where we do our in-house powder, where we can grind herbs into powder for making it topical ointments and things like that. We have a decoction room where we have these um, machines that you might be familiar with. They are basically computerized um, high pressure cookers that are designed to just one thing and one thing alone, which is to efficiently extract the active ingredients from herbs. Then the herbs are then shot into a packaging machine. They package them. And our, our facility is certified by our regional municipal government, York Region. And there are a couple of um, um, competitive advantages with our level of, uh, of professionalism. We use water that is considered 
the United States pharmacopoeia standard, so the highest level of water you can use for, for producing drugs. We have that level of purity in the water that we use. Um, we, our packaging is approved by CFIA, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, so that, that, that plastic is safe for, for food contact and food production. Um, the, the herbs are packaged and cooked in a negative pressure environment. What that means is that nothing, it, uh, air is sucked out of that room, so nothing can fall down onto the packaging machine, again, accidentally get into the packages. Okay. And lastly, I already mentioned uh, we comply with health, um, regional health and health inspection standards. So the final product that you get looks like this. Pouches of herbs, ready to drink. Patients take it home, put it in the fridge, and when they want to drink it, they take it out and they warm it, either in the microwave, they pour it out, warm it in the microwave, over the pan if they don't like microwave, or they can do what this, these pouches are designed are meant to do. Uh, you just simply pour hot water out of the sink, put it in a cup, put these pouches in the cup. A minute or two later, the, the water from the sink will warm through the pouches, and the pouch is ready to drink. Yeah. It's good enough for CFIA, it's good enough for me. Thank you very much, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions.